So we've been looking uh, each day of Holy Week at one of the major themes, preoccupations, concerns of human beings as we try to make sense of life and grow through the various phases and challenges of our lives uh, and to see how these uh, themes or um, issues are reflected, highlighted and dealt with in a very intense and amazing way in the simple story of Holy Week. In other words, the personal journey of Jesus through his passion and his suffering and his death is, is universal. It's not just an individual, it's something that speaks to us and illuminates, enlightens us. And that's part of the meaning of it being redemptive. So I thought we, we it's been a little heavy uh, maybe the last couple of days, so I thought we'd lighten it today and talk about suffering. <laughs> and suffering is a good way, talking about suffering, trying to understand it, is actually a good way of cheering yourself up. And I was wondering why that is, why we feel better after we have reflected on uh, suffering and our attitude towards suffering. And I think it's because we're, we are preoccupied with it. It is a concern, we feel it much of the time at different levels. It's always there in some form or some degree. And much of the time, of course, we, we want to keep it out of sight, under the carpet. We don't want to be thinking about suffering all the time. But it's there all the time. It's part of the, the, the river of life, really. So I think when we do uh, bring it out into the open and talk about it, uh, we feel relieved. We've relieved some pressure. And it's one of the reasons, perhaps, why St. Benedict says that we should keep death constantly before our eyes. Uh, because not because we should be morbid or death-centered, obsessed with death, but precisely that we don't repress it, that it's out there and we are able to uh, address it and confront it and, and share it and the meaning of it with others. So, suffering. And of course, we can't uh, really have any worthwhile approach to Holy Week without dealing with suffering. We see Jesus in the most intense suffering. And suffering is a universal concern of the religious mind. All of the great religions, the wisdom traditions, have a preoccupation of some kind with how to deal with suffering and what is its meaning in the context of our human journey. In uh, a few years ago, uh, when we started the Way of Peace program with uh, the Dalai Lama, the first phase of that program was to, uh, was pilgrimage, to go to each other's sacred sites. So he invited uh, the world community uh, members uh, to India, to Borgaya, and uh, we went there, a couple of hundred of us probably, um, and we had a few wonderful days of dialogue and reflection uh, and meditation together. And we began every morning with uh, a period of meditation at six o'clock, I think, or earlier, under the Bodhi tree, and the Bodhi tree in Borgaya is the tree where the Buddha was enlightened. And it was a remember, uh, after the first meditation, we had planned what to do up to that point. But after the meditation, uh, I was sitting next to the Dalai Lama and I suddenly realized we didn't know what we were going to do next. 
So I, um, I leaned over to him to say, what, what do you think we should do next? Or should we get up? Or do you want to talk now? And, uh, and then we noticed that everybody was looking up at the sky like that. And uh, then we looked up and there was a, a leaf falling from the top of the uh, Bodhi tree or one of the branches. And it was just falling down very slowly. And everybody was waiting to see where it would land. And it landed right in the middle between us. Uh, so that was what we had to do next, was pick up the, the leaf, which I still have in one of my Bibles upstairs. So the, the Buddha was enlightened under the Bodhi tree, um, apparently in his early 30s. And he had, uh, he came to this moment after trying for enlightenment in different ways that didn't work. Extreme asceticism, for example. And when he realized it wasn't going to work, he just said, well, okay, I'm just going to sit here and meditate until I get enlightened. And I'm not going to budge from here. So a sense of complete commitment to the work of meditation which we don't come to on the first day of our journey, or maybe on the 10,000th thousand, 10, day of our journey. But eventually, we have to learn for us to say the mantra with that complete commitment, that complete abandonment of any reservation or any complication. And that's what we find in the teaching of Father John, this this. this insight into the complete commitment uh, of the, med the work of meditation. So, the, so the, uh, the Buddha came to this, and what had led him to this, of course, was the problem of suffering. He had become aware of the reality of suffering, old age, sickness and death, and it devastated him to realize that this was such a universal and inescapable aspect of human life. And all the joys of life, all the privileges, all the pleasures uh, were undermined by this reality of suffering. And so this led him to this moment of complete seriousness, of complete dedication to the work of meditation. And as he was sitting, under the Bodhi tree, that long night, some people say it was three days and three nights, the equivalent to the time of Jesus in the tomb. There are many versions of the story in Buddhism. Um, but during that night, he was tortured by the demon. And the demon uh, tortured him with every possible method of suffering uh, to, to prevent him from being enlightened. Uh, this demon has is, is many different names in Buddhism. It could be identified with death itself, with, but there was sensuality, you know, uh, lust. Uh, this demon is a trickster like the devil in uh, the biblical tradition as well sometimes. And eventually, of course, by his resolute stillness and commitment, his impassivity during this time of, uh, of suffering, of intense internal suffering, uh, the Buddha was enlightened and he touched the earth when challenged about his, the authenticity of his experience, and the earth replied, I bear witness to you. So there are, there are themes in this, I think, that help us to approach the suffering question through Holy Week. Buddhism starts from the discovery of suffering, by Siddhartha, uh, 
and then his quest to escape from the cycle of suffering. And he recognized, of course, by analysis and insight, that suffering is inevitably linked to attachment and desire. Christianity also deals with this universal problem or question of uh, suffering, but with, a, with significant differences, which become very clear as we look at the story of Holy Week. Christianity, of course, starts not from the discovery of suffering and then the attempt to transcend it, to end it, to get out of it. But it starts from the descent from God, the transcendent God, who we always imagine to be beyond suffering. You know, God is, you know, the, the Bible, God is up there watching everything, controlling everything on his great computer. And, uh, but the New Testament begins with the, with the descent of the transcendent divine into the human realm of suffering and death. And the story of the birth of Jesus is already filled with symbols of how Jesus, the incarnation, the human embodiment of the divine, is, has now come into a world of massacres where Herod massacres all the newborn babies uh, into an experience of exile, of being a refugee, of, of being poor, and not having a, a room uh, in, the, in the hotel, uh, even for his, the day of his birth. So from the very beginning, we see the divine entering into the human realm of suffering and death and participating in it with full human feeling. It's not that God was there in a kind of abstract way, observing what was going on, but not really feeling it. This, this was one of the early heretical interpretations of the incarnation, because it's very difficult for the human being, human mind, to accept that God could suffer. It doesn't make sense. So we construct an alternative explanation, which is easier to accept, which is that um, it just looked as if Jesus was suffering. So when it came to the passion and the crucifixion, this, uh, this heresy says, well, yeah, it looked as if he was really having a hard time of it, but actually he, he didn't really feel anything because he was God, which of course rather makes the whole story fake and meaningless, although superficially an easier explanation, but actually it doesn't give us any meaning. So the emphasis in the Christian approach to suffering is not an escape from suffering, although the kingdom of God is the goal, but the emphasis is not put upon escaping suffering, but recognizing that suffering is an inevitable and meaningful part of our journey into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not described as some kind of uh, Garden of Eden where everybody is running around and there's perfect temperature and there's perfect food everywhere and everyone is perfectly healthy and beautiful and young and happy and, you know, we're just running around like having, as a resort, you know, eternal resort somewhere. But uh, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is described in much more real terms. 
in terms of human relationship, of compassion, of connection, of other-centeredness, of love, uh, and of growth. So, the emphasis on the Christian story, and we see this in the story of the Holy Week, is that although the kingdom of God is the goal, embracing our suffering is the way. Embracing it, and only by embracing it do we discover its meaning. If God can suffer in us and with us, what does this teach us about the meaning of suffering and the meaning of our own human journey? First time I went to Auschwitz, uh, I was really overwhelmed by, at first, by a feeling of denial. I kept saying in my mind as I walked around the camp, which was a factory of suffering, just designed to create the worst kind of suffering, meaning, or, or, or I would say meaningless, but un, uncalled for suffering. Why create a factory of death like that? So I was walking around and it was just so unbelievable. In fact, I heard myself saying in my mind, I don't believe this, I don't believe it. So you could understand the Holocaust deniers. It would be like those early Christian thinkers who wanted to deny that God could suffer. So in one of the little cells, under one of the torture chambers where they had put a, I think a Polish soldier, there is a, a little drawing on the wall that this Polish soldier had drawn of, a, of, of Christ on the cross. And it's a very moving, tiny little symbol because it makes you feel that Christ was there during those years, during those days and terrible nights of, of human nightmare, of the suffering of the victims of the camp, that Christ was there. So the question, how does God let this happen, is not such a good question. I mean, we have to ask it, but it, it's not going to lead us to the right understanding of suffering. We can only understand it if we see that God is in the suffering, with us, suffers with us. And that, of course, is the heart of the Christian understanding of, of Holy Week. So, it helps maybe though to make a distinction, first of all, between pain and suffering. So pain is temporary, like a toothache, like a missing a plane and having a lot of inconvenience. And things go wrong, maybe badly wrong, but it's unpleasant, it may even be unbearable for a time. But it's basically something temporary that will pass. My, uh, in, my uh, Wi-Fi internet connection failed the day before yesterday, as you know, and uh, very inconvenient, very frustrating. I wouldn't say it was maybe it wasn't suffering, but it was a pain. We say that as a pain in the neck, or we say if somebody. Uh, they have a pain in the neck, <laughs> pain somewhere else sometimes. <laughs> but suffering is different. Suffering is also painful. You can't have suffering without pain. It could be physical pain, it could be mental pain, and there's even a kind of spiritual pain, as we'll see. But suffering 
is painful, but also it is deep and inescapable. So it has the sense of being continuous. So I was saying, suffering is always there in life, from the very first moment, all the way. It's not always dominant, it's not always visible, we don't always feel it, but it's there, always. At times, it surges up from a deep and inescapable place, reminding us that it is always there. And it takes you where you would rather not go, as Jesus says to Peter. Jesus predicted his own suffering and death. And there are several passages where he tells his disciples on their way to Jerusalem, this is what they are going to uh, must be prepared for, but they don't understand it, they don't want to hear it. So we deny that. And I think it makes sense that he did know, not by some sort of uh, magical uh, ability to see into the future, but that he, it makes sense to me that he did know that this would be his fate. And it's an important part of our understanding of Jesus. It feels realistic that a person of his depth, of his enlightenment, of spiritual intelligence, and his ability to read people, his wise perception of people and events and circumstances, would know what his fate would be when he got to Jerusalem. So he begins to teach us about suffering sometime before Holy Week, early on in his life, when he knows what he is moving towards. Maybe that part of his life that corresponds to the Buddha uh, under the Bodhi tree is Jesus' time in the, uh, in the desert where he suffered temptation um, and where he learned to accept suffering and accept the fact that suffering will come and that it will eventually lead each one of us to die. But that's simple, simple clarity and insight. He was obedient to this trajectory of his life. This was the direction in which he was moving. He, he, he saw that and he accepted it. And he did not seek to deny it, to distract himself from it, or to find false consolation, which is how we tend to deal with this perception of suffering when it, when it comes. When we can't avoid it, we try either to deny it. There was a lot of denial from many leaders, stewards, uh, politically, uh, about the um, the present uh, pandemic when it started. Uh, it's nothing very much, just like the flu, don't worry about it. So there's denial. Then there was distraction. So keep the people distracted and you know, try to f control the news. We still often don't trust the news even. And false consolation. And this is something that most of most of the world, when we're shut up in our apartments or, <coughs> or rooms, uh, will have to face the danger of distraction. Because this is a time of suffering all around us and maybe for ourselves personally at different levels, 
psychological or physical. So it's very important that we do reflect deeply upon the meaning of suffering so that we can learn how to deal with it, to embrace it, accept it and embrace it in the right way, rather than, as it were, miss the opportunity and increase the, the, the pain and the suffering by distraction or denial. So accepting the suffering of life brings us to humility. Humility is the only wisdom, uh, T.S. Eliot says. Humility is the earth, humus, the earth. This was the earth that the Buddha touched and the earth witnessed to the authenticity of his wisdom. So suffering can bring us down to earth, grounds us. It's very important during this time, I think so many of us are isolated, just have the computer screen or the TV, that we don't lose touch with our bodies, with all of the fear or anxiety we may have about our physical well-being. So here at Bombo, Giovanni is leading yoga sessions every day during the retreat and we'll be putting up some yoga uh, classes that he'll lead uh, shortly. Um, and to have some way, even if it's, if it's not yoga, you know, walking in nature, in the park, in the woods, wherever, however you can, some way physically to be connected to our bodies and to the material world. This is humility, this is the beginning of humility. Accepting suffering in life brings us to humility, down to earth, and it brings us down from the sky where we are abstracting, conceptualizing, talking, thinking only about things. But it brings us down from the sky, down to earth, as meditation does, of course. Meditation is a very physical journey when we sit still and silent for the 20 minutes, 30 minutes of the meditation. We are there embodied, it's incarnational. So in this crisis, uh, our whole global culture, everything that has shaped us mentally, psychologically, emotionally, uh, intellectually. Our whole global culture is being humbled. Many leaders, of course, are being humiliated also by the revelation that they didn't prepare for this very well. That we are, here we have this great technological culture, that society we've developed and we can't test people for their virus in sufficient numbers and sufficient speed, which would be the most obvious way to control it, to know who's got it and to keep those people safe and out of contact with others. So it's humiliating, it should be humiliating for, for, for some of the people to whom we entrusted our insurance policies. Culturally, it's very difficult for us to accept suffering as well because we are a culture based upon hedonism, upon the pursuit of pleasure. This came out in some of our dialogues with Alan Wallace uh, and Eva uh, the other, uh, last week uh, into contemplative dialogues that we had. Our idea of happiness is based very powerfully upon satisfying our desires and increasing our pleasures and distracting ourselves from the pain or the suffering of life. 
So we don't accept suffering very well. We don't do suffering very well in our culture. We're not trained for it, particularly in the affluent parts of the world. And even in those affluent parts of the world which have large swathes of poverty, over a million children, I think, uh, in poverty in, in the United Kingdom, who are hungry unless they have free meals at school. So when we say rich societies, we talk about a certain part of these affluent societies. But even the poorer members of, of our societies are also often caught up in this fantasy of the pursuit of pleasure. And if they can't be rich and famous themselves, then they buy magazines about the personal lives of the rich and famous and do it through fantasy. Culturally, we felt very certain about our technological ability to transcend suffering. And if you can't transcend it, then you just end life. There's no meaning in it. There's no meaning in suffering. If you can't escape from it, if you can't transcend it, if you can't dull it, if you can't take an opioid to dull the pain, uh, if you can't run away from it, then just end it. There's no meaning in it, in itself. But we are being humbled by this COVID-19 virus because we don't know how to deal with it. We don't have the technology yet. We can be pretty certain we will eventually, but, but in the meantime, we also have to learn the uncertainty of suffering because there is no predictable solution. So what does suffering bring us? We can, we can look into the nature of suffering just by what we're going through now. And we can see the same things in the story of Jesus. First of all, there's powerlessness. We're knocked out of the self-centered view of reality that we have. We're no longer in control. And we're no longer the ego center of the world. We are vulnerable. Life is unpredictable. We've lost control. We cannot make long-term plans. And we may be losing people, people we love or people we're separated from. And even our own sense of identity, maybe we've lost our jobs. Maybe we can't get to work and, and, and do the work we like or wanted to do or need to do. And of course, there's also death, the ultimate social distancing uh, of death. So suffering today around us is very present and shows itself through these different aspects, the powerlessness of unpredictability and of many kinds of loss. Now, there will be an end to this wave of suffering. But will it have led us to the wisdom that suffering should give us? The wisdom of embracing suffering when it comes again, because it will come again. If we can, it may even have been worthwhile. <laughs> we may even say, as sometimes we say in life, when we've been through a very difficult, terrible period after a sufficient amount of time, we look back and we'll say, well, that was terrible, but it taught me something I could not have learned in any other way. Now, you can't say that when you're in the middle of, this, of the suffering, and you shouldn't say it to somebody else. Don't worry, you'll be grateful for this one day. It's not a very helpful or compassionate uh, response to the suffering of others. But it is true, we can, we can probably see this in our own lives, that we look back at very painful, difficult moments in our life, and we can see that it, it did teach us something, as Patricia Ng, 
uh, said in this uh, video, which uh, we should put up on our new webpage, uh, Contemplative Path, from panic to peace. And she was diagnosed with cancer in her early 50s and was given three months to live. And it actually meant that she had 19 months to live. Difficult time separating from her, from, from Peter, her husband, and her family, and her community. Uh, and, but then shortly before she died, I had a conversation with her, which is on this video, from Panic to Peace, and she says this amazing thing. She says this last 19 months have been very, very painful. But I would willingly go through it all again because of what it has taught me. And you can feel by the tone and the look in her eyes that she is speaking from wisdom gained through suffering. If we can embrace suffering, it becomes worthwhile. It becomes meaningful. We will have discovered that suffering transforms us when we embrace it. We will discover that it is natural. Punishment, uh, sorry, suffering is not a punishment. It's not a curse. It's just there as part of nature. Suffering opens us when we embrace it to other dimensions of reality. It brings us closer to God. If we can accept it as humbly as we accept joy and fulfillment. So we should be able to see how Jesus passes through the scenes of Holy Week, the scenes of his suffering. And how does he pass through them in deep silence, but at the same time fully present? He's isolated, socially isolated, because of the way he's being treated. This is not a nice way to die, to be tortured, to be humiliated, to be rejected, to be made fun of. This is not a nice way to treat someone, but he is fully present, other-centered to the end. And at the end, he becomes utterly turned towards others. In, even on the cross, he, he, uh, Dresses in one gospel, he addresses his mother and puts and asks his beloved disciple John to take uh, care of his mother. Or he speaks to the thief being crucified on the other side of him, uh, who appeals to him and and he gives him. Uh, the invitation to come into the kingdom with him. And uh, as we'll see when we look at Ma Matthew, uh, he even on the way of the cross as he's traveling up the, the towards Golgotha, uh, he speaks to the, to the women of Jerusalem. So he's other-centered, fully present, and yet other-centered without complaint, without self-pity, or anger. Often suffering pushes us into these understandable states of, of, of anger, sadness, withdrawal, depression, complaint. But we don't see that in the way Jesus embraces his suffering. So perhaps one way we can also understand uh, suffering in Holy Week, is through the mystical tradition, which speaks about the suffering that we will pass through on the journey of meditation. 
This is not how meditation is presented uh, as a product uh, in the marketplace today. It's uh, presented more often simply as a way of, 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 of um, you know, feeling better. And of course, we know that it does bring many benefits, physical and psychological. But it would be, it's a, it's a misinterpretation. It's only half the story if we speak about meditation only as this kind of way of consoling a kind of a, even a, at the worst, a kind of spiritual opioid that you use in order to escape suffering. But the mystical tradition teaches us that the journey of meditation was going to take us into suffering in order to teach us how to embrace it. And if we can embrace it in meditation, we can embrace it in life. And that's why this is a precious opportunity for many people uh, during this crisis to be able to, to take the time to organize your daily timetable at home to put in times of meditation and get the support you need online or wherever uh, to begin a practice, to learn to meditate or to learn more deeply how to meditate or to understand what meditation is and how deeply it brings you into the discovery of the meaning of life and of your own true self. That it's not just a feel good, uh, feel better kind of uh, uh, exercise. So, how does the mystical tradition uh, teach us this? It says, at a certain point in your life, could be very young, if we're lucky, introduced to meditation as children, as, as we do, or it could be uh, at any other point in your life, you will find that you have the opportunity to learn to meditate. When that moment comes, embrace it. So John of the Cross says, for example, for, to speaking to religious people, and people were more religious in his day than they are today, you will find that at a certain point in your spiritual life, you, you'll find that the old forms of religious prayer and de devotion and so on will cease to satisfy you. And you will feel there's something more. It doesn't mean that you were wrong before, but it means you've just come to a different place on your evolution, your, in your spiritual journey. And when you get to that place, then you have to decide, are you going to go into this contemplative dimension of prayer, this contemplative level of your journey, or are you going to just keep try to stay back? Because if you go forward into this contemplative level, if your faith is maturing in this way, and you allow it to, and you're not trying to stay back in a kind of immature stage, then you will have to let go of the consolations of the, of the kind of the pleasures and the reassurances that, that a certain kind of religious practice could give you. At the very worst, it would be the kind of gospel of prosperity, the false uh, illusory hopes that uh, people get sold by false evangelists you know, um, give me your money and God will give you, give it back to you with, with, with interest. So that would be the most basic sort of level of, of materialistic uh, spirituality. But there are many others too, where we just become almost addicted to certain types of devotional uh, consolation or devotional religion. That doesn't mean to say when you start to meditate that you have to abandon all of those, 
each person is different. But I think it does mean that your relationship to those other forms of devotional religion will be changed. You will have to become detached from the um, uh, the feelings of, uh, of, of of sweetness, consolation, the sort of emotional feelings that that they can bring you. You have to become un you have to become detached from that. And this is what Saint John of the Cross calls the dark night of the senses. So the sensual aspect of religious experience is changing and you have to let go of it and this will involve as all detachment does some suffering but then he also describes another kind of dark night that he calls the dark night of the spirit and he says not everybody gets to this you might say, well, thank goodness, I'd rather not get to it either. But this dark night of the spirit is where the sense of separation becomes acute. And as suffering tends to isolate us, it can also be a bridge between us and other people. But initially, suffering isolates us. And it's part of the worst part of suffering is this feeling of isolation, of being picked out and set, set aside, being isolated. So this feeling of separation from God, from ourselves, from other people, this is uh, what St. John of the Cross explores in, this, uh, in his teaching on the dark night of the Spirit. And yet, and yet, he says, O oh, happy night, when he, perhaps it's in his poetry above all that we, that he it communicates the meaning of suffering on the spiritual journey. O oh, happy night, because although this is a night and it is a isolation or separation, and we don't feel connected even to God, or even to ourselves, Nevertheless, there is something from another dimension of reality that we are discovering that gives us hope. We don't know how to justify that hope, but the hope is there. And we don't know when it's going to happen, but we know it is real. So we only have to begin this journey of meditation to begin to learn what suffering means and to begin to uh, understand how we must embrace suffering in daily life or in this phase of our, our global life that we're going through. Now that's not to say that, that is the, the, the meaning of suffering is simply that we have to embrace it. The meaning of suffering is that it teaches us, it prepares us for something we could not learn in any other way. But what it teaches us is the true nature of God and our own true nature and the compatibility or the friendship or the identity even between ourselves and God. And that is, that grows out of suffering. And of course, we can also glimpse it in joy, in moment, times of fulfillment, times when we are just full of life and joy and plenitude. But suffering is part of that picture as well. So in the mystical tradition, and through our own experience of meditation, we, we have wisdom to guide us 
to understand how to deal with this present anxiety that we and the rest of the world are going through. But it also, it also teaches us how to persevere without collapsing into distraction and denial. How to persevere and how, for example, when you sit to meditate and it doesn't seem to be a good meditation and you seem to be totally distracted and you don't seem to be getting anywhere and all these nice words about meditation and spirituality just seem words and empty ideas and there's nothing. I don't feel any of that. Well, those are the times where you have most to learn. And that's where, of course, we need support and encouragement and a sense of community. No one can, no one, I don't think, can, can meditate entirely on their own because meditation will bring you to a sense of communion and community and connection. But also no one can suffer or embrace suffering on their own. Uh, we have to go through it in solitude. But if we are embracing it, we will then see how our own experience of suffering, loss, anxiety, loss of control, is, is actually being felt and experienced by other people. And so the suffering can be a, a bridge across the very sense of separation that it creates. So it separates us, but it can also, at the same time, connect us, if we allow it to. And meditation is basically a simple way that we share together of allowing ourselves to learn from what life brings us.